Welcome to uh, the Eric Hilton Distinguished Chair Alumni Lecture. I'm Greg Rocket, a graduate of the Hilton College from 1986. I'm currently Vice President of Corporate Hotel Development at Hilton Worldwide. And I'm also the Chairman of uh, Eric's Club as this group of alumni is informally known. Uh, today we recognize and celebrate the outstanding career of a distinguished alumni of the Hilton College. I congratulate Charles Dorn uh, on his accomplishments and appreciate his activism and contributions uh, to the Hilton College during uh, most of his career after graduation. Uh, the distinguished alumni here today, and we are about 10 that you see up here in the front row, I'm 11, hi Dorothy, uh, we, uh, we, we meet twice annually uh, with the faculty and the students to have the opportunity to hear the success story of a member of Eric's Club. Uh, the goal of Eric's Club is to promote the mission of the Hilton College by building on a legacy of student inspiration, alumni connectivity, and just general resource support to the Hilton College. Uh, this Distinguished Chair Alumni Series, that is no, as it is known, is uh, not just a recognition and a celebration of the career of one of our distinguished alumni but it also demonstrates the prospects for you as students, our current student body, uh, for your future. This is a great college with outstanding current and former students, and hopefully this distinguished chair alumni lecture series impresses upon all of you the potential for success uh, that you have in life, whether it's in the hospitality or related career or some other career afterwards. So I encourage you to take advantage of this program. There's another event at 2 o'clock this afternoon in the Hall of Honor, a Q&A with Charles. Uh, through networking and mutual support among uh, alumni ranks, we can contribute to the success of fellow alumni, but also uh, raise awareness of the Conrad N. Hilton College of Hotel and Restaurant Management. So now I, I'd like to ask uh, our past lecturer, Steve Goodman, to come up and introduce Charles Dorn. Good morning. Charles, Charles Dorn is a 1980 graduate of the Conrad and Hilton College, but I also recall some 20 years back ago, back in the early 90s, he was already considered uh, a distinguished alumnus. He had served as general manager of the Chemist Club in New York City, as well as the Union Club of the City of New York. Uh, as a student, he lived in the dorms. Uh, all four years, he lived in Moody Towers. I asked him for uh, an interesting story about Moody Towers, because I, I, too, lived in the dorms for my, my undergrad years. And he was telling me that he had the honor of having the key to the snack bar in Moody Towers. So at night, he would sneak down there, and he and his friends, they would cook up a storm and, and eat, and uh, and uh, they would just kind of use the, use the snack bar at their whim. I didn't, didn't really ask him if they paid for any of the product that came out of the snack bar that night, but he was telling me that one night the head RA for the Moody Towers, a gentleman at that time by the name of Bobby Brownstein, uh, was quietly sitting in the back corner in, in, in one of the booths and all of a sudden he, he realized that the head RA was sitting there watching everything that they were doing, but he also saw Bobby uh, eating the food that he was cooking there because he, as an HRM student, he knew how to put on a, 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 a good meal. Um, he was also the first student president of the uh, Cougar chapter of the Club Managers Association of America, of CMAA. Um, he's going to tell you much about his career, so I'm not going to take the thunder away from, from his presentation, but I did want to also let you know that he's been involved in hospitality education. He's an adjunct faculty member at the Preston Robert Tisch Center for Hospitality, Tourism, and Sports Management at New York University. He served on the Business Council at the University of New Haven's hotel program. He's lectured at New York uh, City uh, Technical College, Vocational Foundation in New York. He's even lectured at some place called Cornell University. Uh, I heard they have a hotel school too. Um, and of course he's lectured here at the University of Houston and he serves um, as chairman of the Dean's Advisory Board for the Hilton College. Please welcome Charles Dorn. Well, hopefully that works. Okay, Andy, you're not going to yell at me because I turned that on? Thanks. Um, 
Well, I want to do, before I do anything, I'd like to start by acknowledging um, uh, two people, um, one of whom is, is with us today and one of whom is not. Uh, the person I'd like to start by acknowledging is Dr. Rapol. Um, certainly without Clint uh, and Clint's involvement, most of what I've done in my career would in fact not have occurred. Um, I was, uh, as uh, Steve mentioned, I was the first president of the student chapter of CMAA, of the Cougar chapter, and it was only through Dr. Rapol's how do we say polite, incessant pressure um, that that took place because I really didn't want to do it. I had probably more pressing interest as you can imagine uh, cooking as you just heard and doing things late at night, fraternity, there was some beer involved but uh, Dr. Rapol uh, um, kind of coerced me into that and I believe at one point I tried to quit and he wouldn't let me um, and so here I am uh, 36 years later uh, with a career primarily in the club business and uh, I, I really hats off to, to Clinton thank you for that and everything you've done in Eric's club and, and so I really wanted to, to mention that. The other person that I wanted to mention uh, who's not here and some of you have had the opportunity to speak and certainly everybody in Eric's club has heard is uh, Don Smith. For those of you that have never heard Don Smith speak when he comes to campus um, go. Let me just say that um, it's an incredible experience uh, I'm extremely close to Don today, and Don would have been here, but Don and his wife Jackie are in Bangkok, and um, I, I'm not going. And since when Doug Brooks spoke uh, last year, I was inducted into the Hall of Honor, Don canceled that trip to Bangkok to be there for Doug. He decided that it was not appropriate. Um, to cancel the trip twice because Jackie would not have been particularly happy. So with those comments aside, I want to, um, most of my comments are going to be kind of on the fly, but I want to read you just something and, uh, real quickly, and it just says, I'm honored that you've asked me to speak here today. It's good to be in Texas. It's good to be in Houston again. Uh, 36 years ago, I, I put down my first frightened, unsophisticated foot into the sophistication of Texas. That day I started down a long road. That is literally a paraphrased quote from Conrad Hilton given on October 28th, 1969 when he came to Houston to uh, present the money for this college. And so um, a lot of my career in some ways has, has followed Mr. Hilton and what I'd like to do is spend a few minutes and kind of walk you through my career and then I'll go ahead and uh, talk about some of the, the principles and the values that uh, have marked that career. So if we've done this correctly, whoop. well, of course, I just went, oh, well, we'll do the first one. Um, I started out my career actually prior to college and the first, two, this first summer before and after the first year here at the Rytown Hilton, and that's the Rytown Hilton in the upper left. Um, what I can tell you is it's extremely important to take something out of every place you worked, good and bad. I could sit here and tell you about stories at the Rytown Hilton as a then 17 year old my first summer um, of what maybe what is the worst boss in the world but as a result of having worked for him I made a conscious decision to never treat people the way he did. I can tell you about the opportunity to do a wedding for the daughter of the largest mafia family in New York at the time. To give you a sense, this was in 1979. The gentleman walked into the general manager's office one morning and said, I'd like to make a deposit on my daughter's wedding. And the GM said, as you would not be surprised, I don't have to take it. And the guy said, no, I'd like you to take it. And he pulled an envelope out of his pocket, handed it to the general manager, and the general manager said, let me, um, I'll get, I'll get a receipt for it. He goes, no, I trust you. And the general manager opened it, and there were $51,000 bills. Um, that was the deposit. This was 1979. The wedding cost a quarter of a million dollars. They closed the hotel for the weekend um, because they bought the whole hotel. The wedding cost over a half a million dollars. Imagine me, 17 year olds coming to work and every door is manned by the FBI and they are taking pictures of every single person walking in. The guests had rights to walk in the entire club or the entire uh, hotel, do anything they wanted and they did. They went, did massage, they went and ate and drank. 
Um, they had one party after the wedding that had an eight-piece band. They had a party that night that had a 21-piece band. It was, it was ridiculous. They spent a half a million dollars in cash. I took Sunday off and came back on Monday morning, and on Monday morning there was a banquet room, probably 50% of the size of this room, that was full of flowers that were not used. I took three dozen flowers home, red roses, 24-inch stem red roses, home to my mother, who thought, what did I do? What did my son do? What kind of <laughs> trouble did he get in this weekend? Um, and the fact is, they were all unused. They were left, and it later came out that the gentleman that owned the floral uh, place had a large debt to the family, and he took care of the flowers. So, um, I mean, I could tell you about those kinds of stories, but you know, they're once in a lifetime learning experiences. And, I, and I'll tell you that the most important one is the one I mentioned at the beginning, which is having a really bad boss. And, and I swore when that happened that I would never treat employees the way that, that he treated me. And I'd like to believe that I, in fact, uh, learned. That picture, which is a very old picture, and I was kind of joking when we put the slides up this morning with Andy, who's up on the camera. Um, for those of you that don't realize, that's Moody Towers probably, and the, the college, probably when most of us went to school. So the back building's not there. Um, there's a parking lot, actually, that's not there anymore in between Moody Towers and, uh, and the college. Um, so the, the space we're in today was not there. Um, it is a very different place. So, okay, Andy. There we go. Um, the next sum the next summer was at the Rye Town. I'm sorry, at the uh, Meadowlands Hilton. And you go. Anyone wants to go look it up, you won't find it anymore. It's no longer a Hilton property. Um, I did the opening of this hotel. I had the luxury because of my two summers at the Rye Town Hilton to get transferred to the project team that opened this hotel. Uh, we had built a new ballroom at Rye Town the, the second summer I was there. I was assigned to that project team. So the whole team moved over to open this hotel. This hotel is located on wetlands in a swamp directly adjacent to uh, basically the Meadowlands Stadium, which some of you might know the home of the New York Giants. That's the Super Bowl winning New York Giants. In case there was any question, anybody forgot that already. Um, but this was an interesting situation because I was there for the 90 days approximately between the end of the spring semester and uh, the beginning of the fall semester. And the hotel opened two days after I left. So that having been said, the last 30 days, and again, learning from each property, the last 30 days that I was there, I lived in 30 different hotel rooms. Now, what happens, as you can imagine, I was in charge of receiving for the hotel. Well. When you're talking about receiving of a brand new hotel, that means everything, okay? Yes, it means the obvious things that you would expect, um, china, glass, silver, furniture, but what you don't know is that this was a union property, okay? So the lamps come in one morning, and I don't think anything of it, and I don't unload them, obviously the laborers do. So the laborers start to unload the lamp, and immediately we have a union problem because the electricians come over, and the electricians say to us, no, 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 the laborers can't unload the lamps. Those are electric. We unload them. So we had a union fight. And of course, what ends up happening is the job comes to a standstill. Um, we have a union fight. And typically, what ends up happening in that situation is for every two laborers, we have to have a union electrician. And of course, there's never a union electrician around when you need one in that case. And so they have to wait and get one from the hiring hall. So the whole job stops for two hours because we don't have an electrician to unload the lamps. Um, again, a great learning lesson because the vast part of my career ended up getting spent in New York City and dealing with unions. And it's a whole different world. Moving on, this is um, the only picture I could find in my I guess between my sophomore and, I'm sorry, my junior and my senior year, I spent the summer in a rather unique scenario. Um, as Steve mentioned, I was the first president of the chapter, and I went to the club manager's convention, and I was one of four students at the club manager's convention. Um, every time you walk down a hall, somebody would say, oh wow, there's one of those students, let's buy him a drink. Oh wait, I guess I shouldn't have said that. Um, but we actually had a table in the exposition and the four of us stood behind the table like this with our resumes and handed out probably 50 copies of our resume. I go back to, to Houston actually um, and I get a phone call from a guy 
And the guy says, Charles, my name is Vern Johnson. I'm the general manager of Guyan Golf and Country Club in Huntington, West Virginia. Now just imagine this. New York, Jewish boy, Huntington, West Virginia. Those, those aren't typically things that you would have in the same sentence. But I will tell you that I learned a lot about fried bologna. Okay, <laughs> never, had, never had had fried bologna. It's really good if you get good bologna. Um, biscuits and gravy made the right way. Okay, um, but what did I learn? I learned that people in different parts of the country don't know some of the things we know. I walked into the kitchen my very first day. I was uh, probably 20 years old, as I mentioned. Um, I'm hired as the assistant manager for the summer. Have no management experience, no leadership experience, except maybe what I did in college and at some of the clubs. And of course, I walk in, and I walk in, I'm introduced. I walk into the kitchen day one. There's Freddie, the chef. And we're having a conversation, and I said, what's going on? He said, we have a party tonight, prime rib, blah, 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 no big deal. And I walk over to the stove, and there is this bubbling pot of yellow something. And I said, Freddie, what's this? And he goes, it's mock hollandaise. Now to me, mock hollandaise comes out of a dried mix. You just don't make it. And I said, okay, what's mock hollandaise? And Freddie says, oh. I take a jug of mayonnaise and I take a jug of mustard and I dump them in the pot and I heat them up. And I went, eww. Not to mention the idea of heating up mayonnaise just really was not a psychological good idea. And I said to Fred, you know, next time you get your grocery deliveries, um, you might want to get some North Swiss dried or another product dried hollandaise instead of this. And he goes, you can buy this stuff dried? And I thought, oh, it's going to be a long summer. <laughs> the best part of, of, of being there, aside from what I told you, is that Freddie's father was a bona fide moonshiner. <laughs> okay? And all summer long, Freddie told me about his father. And, and I said, you know, before I leave to go back to Houston, I want to try shine. So the last week I was there, Freddie took me out to his father's place. There were all these little birds running around. And I'm going, well, they weren't little. They were like this. And I said, what are those, Fred? And he goes, they're quail. I said, no, they're not. Quail are like this. You know, you buy quail you know, frozen, typically, at that point. Oh, no, these are quail. They probably weighed three pounds each. They were quail. They were god-awful because they were old and tough. But anyways, Fred said to his father, uh, Hey, Dad, Charles wants to try shine. His father didn't trust him. It took us two hours of convincing his father that I was not a moonshine, uh, federal agent. And finally, he took me out to the backyard. And just like you see in the movies, he, there was a pile of rocks, and he lifted a rock, and the rock was all tied into like 10 other rocks, and it was on a spring-loaded thing, and he brought out a jug. Well, I will tell you that I had hair before I tried the shine. Okay, <laughs> this is the result of trying the moonshine. Tried it once, never again. Okay, so then we go on from uh, Guyane, came back here, and then I graduated, and I got a job offer. From Whitney Travis. Whitney Travis was the first, or was a CMA national president at the Stock Exchange Luncheon Club in New York. The club, located on the seventh floor of the exchange at that time, did 1,100 meals a day. It did 400 breakfasts, it did 700 lunches, and of the 700, 300 of which were actually served on the floor of the exchange. Back in those days, the exchange was not computerized. That's how old I am. I'm a dinosaur. And um, we were not allowed to bring liquids onto the floor of the stock exchange. We were only allowed to bring things like sandwiches. The chef had to go through when they printed the daily menu and actually indicate the items that had too much liquid in them because they were afraid that if somebody came with literally a container of stew, if the stew fell on the pieces of paper, they would kill all sorts of stock trades. So I had floor privileges. I stayed there for a short amount of time because actually I had been hired by Whitney believing that his then assistant manager was leaving. He wasn't leaving. So I stayed a short time and I moved on. And I moved on to um, something totally different. And this is the Parker Meridian Hotel in New York. The Parker Meridian Hotel was Meridian's first hotel in the United States. They had absolutely no idea. They were, they were a French company at that point. They had no idea on how to run a hotel in New York. The first time uh, we brought food into them, and I was the receiving manager, 
Uh, the first time that we brought food in, the chef said he wanted eggs, and we got him what you all probably have seen if you've worked in any kind of a kitchen, a 30 dozen container of eggs. And he started cursing me out in French, and he explained to me that what he wanted was a dozen eggs. And I said, I understand that, but this is the way we buy them here in the States. He expected me to go down to the farmer's market and buy him a dozen eggs. Well, factually, in New York in 19, early 1980s, we didn't even have farmer's markets. He thought I was going to take a little basket and walk down the street <laughs> and pick him up a dozen eggs. It was kind of tough because he spoke no English and I spoke no French. For some reason, we got along. I don't, I don't know why. Um, I left the hotel um, to go to my next job. and. He ended up in a straight jacket, and I'm not quite sure what happened. But um, I, I, on the other hand, did something a little radically different. He got in a straight jacket and got taken away. I left and went to work for Hilton. When I graduated here, I got offered a job in the training program in Atlanta. Being a typical, brash, 20-year-old student, I said, I don't need a training program. I've worked for you guys for a couple of semesters. I know everything. So I went back to New York. Well, they offered me a job and I had a choice of director of purchasing in Parsippany, New Jersey or Anchorage, Alaska. So that's the Anchorage Hilton. I spent three years in Anchorage. The answer was, if you're going to pack up and move, you might as well have fun. It was a once in a lifetime experience. What did I learn in that job? Planning. Being a purchasing agent in Anchorage, Alaska is not like being a purchasing agent in Houston or New York or anywhere else. You have to learn to plan. There are some things, most of the things that come into the hotel, you actually order in what they call the lower 48, the continental United States, have them shipped to Seattle, annually negotiate shipping rates, frozen, dry, uh, refrigerated, and have it all shipped up. So once it gets to Seattle, it takes four days on a ship to get up, then get unloaded. So you have to really learn to plan. If, for example, if you ran out of lettuce, and these numbers aren't necessarily real, but if I bought a case of lettuce back in those days for $10 that got shipped up, including shipping, it might have cost me $10.5. If I bought that same case of lettuce from the local Anchorage purchasing agent, a purchasing company, um, or food distributorship, that case of lettuce could have cost $25 because they brought it up either on their ship and held it knowing I'd need it, or they brought it up by air. So you don't make those mistakes often because then the food and beverage director comes down and slaps you on the side of the head and says, why do we spend $25 for a case of $10 lettuce? Did three years in Anchorage, um, originally as purchasing agent, then became the general manager of the Petroleum Club, which is a private club located inside the hotel, and then ran their gourmet restaurant, which again, keeping in mind that this is the early 80s, um, or mid 80s, 57 seats, and did a million dollars in business. And the vast majority of that business got done uh, in the summers when we would do triple turnovers in the restaurant when the tourists came in. Um, a, a totally different concept. Um, asked Hilton if I could move at some point. Um, Hilton gave me an opportunity at one point to, to do the purchasing at LAX. The, the hotel they had then opened at the Los Angeles airport. I didn't want to stay in purchasing, so I left Hilton and actually came to New York, and this is what was the Chemist's Club, located a block from Grand Central Station in New York. Started at the Chemist Club as the assistant manager, eventually became the general manager, and one of the unusual things was that in 1988 we closed this building with the intent of uh, moving on and moving into a new space, we reopened in a new space in 1993, and, that, and it became a merger between ourselves and what is now known, and this is a very small world, what is now known as club quarters. And to tell you just how small a world this is, as we were standing outside the room a couple of minutes ago, uh, Dr. Bowen mentioned to me that he had dinner last night with the, one of the chief operating officers of Club Quarters, a guy named Al Van Ness. Well, I worked with Al Van Ness for four years to get the Chemist Club and Club Quarters open. Um, Al Van Ness has a, is a former Dallas Cowboy. He's, I still like him, but that's a different story. Um, <laughs> learned a lot. And for a couple of years, I actually operated a club that didn't have a clubhouse. Our members had privileges in, in five different clubs in New York, and um, I actually spent my time going between all those five clubs. Um, I moved on to what I think, to me, 
is the piece de day resistance in the club business, um, the Union Club of the City of New York. The Union Club is located on Park Avenue, about 20 blocks north of the Waldorf Astoria. It's 110,000 square feet. This building was built in 1936, uh, 1932, but the uh, Union Club actually is the oldest continuous private club in the United States and actually goes back to uh, 1836. It's a gentleman's club. Uh, there are no members that, that are female which is, and we don't have enough time to talk about it, there are ways to do it legally. Um, and as a result, the club does no business. The only money they take is for, the, is for social or charitable purposes. You are not allowed to do business in this club. So to this day, uh, no cell phones, no Blackberries, no corporate money. If you are a member and you come in and you want to do your daughter's wedding or your son's wedding, fine. You want to do your anniversary party, fine. If you want to do your holiday party for your business, they won't do it. Um, nationally or internationally ranked squash pros, uh, five squash courts upstairs, uh, 29 bedrooms, basically like a small private hotel. Great experience. I came in having replaced a gentleman by the name of Gene Scanlon. Gene had been the general manager of the Waldorf Astoria. Gene had been the executive chef at the Waldorf, the executive chef at the Fountain Blue, and they were very tough shoes to fill. The biggest problem that I found when I got to the Union Club was, and this is um, no disrespect to anybody, the inmates were running the asylum. Uh, the union had a complete lock on this property, and my job was, I was told when I was hired, was to fix the problem. It took me six or seven years. It took me four union contracts to, to deal with it. Um, and then I woke up in 2005, the beginning of 2005, and said, okay, I've accomplished everything I want to accomplish at the union club. What's next? And the answer is my business. And so now I do the Dorn Group. The Dorn Group does strategic planning operational consulting and executive search and the, and the bulk of the executive search and actually the bulk of the business is in the private club industry. What I'd like to do is spend um, a couple of minutes and talk to you um, about some of the principles that, that I've kind of worked by and lived by and, and when I was looking around for, for quotes the other day, I found a Conrad Hilton quote, very short one, and it's simply, success seems to be connected with action. Successful people keep moving. They make mistakes, but they don't quit. We all make mistakes, and I've made more than probably anybody in this room. But you, you bounce back, you get up, and you figure out a way to make it happen. So the very first, um, oh, actually, I have a couple more Union Club slides in here, just so you can see the lobby. And uh, that's actually the, what's now the ballroom. It was originally the, the member's lounge. Um, the very first thing I want to talk to you about is the difference of a manager and a leader. I will tell you that it doesn't matter whether you want to be a manager or be a leader. The fact is that there's a very different basis on what these, how these exist. Okay? Not everybody is going to be a great leader and not everybody is going to be a great manager. But be great at what you do, okay? If you, if you are one of those people that has the leadership genes, that's wonderful, use it. If you are one of those people who knows today that you don't want to lead, but yet you wanna, you're gonna be a, a manager of some sort, whether it's your own business, whether it's in a hotel, you're a department head, whatever it is, be the best manager you can. But don't necessarily assume that you have to do both or can do both. They don't come easily, but you need to be the best you can. Consistency is something that sounds so basic and so easy. Well, the fact is, it's not easy. It's not easy when we're talking about managing employees or not talk when you're talking about you know, you think about something as simple as consistency as relates to employees that I just started to say a second ago. If you appear, and you all probably have worked for a boss somewhere along the line who's inconsistent, and he or she appears wishy-washy, there's nothing worse in the world to employees when in fact that happens. You know, you don't give them the right message, you don't know what your job is, you do, they don't know what their job is, and in fact, you need to actually be consistent to be successful. There is nothing worse. You're allowed to change your mind. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I once had the opportunity to hear Norman Schwarzkopf, General Norman Schwarzkopf speak, and for those of you 
in this room that are on the younger side, I'll let you go look at figure out what he did. We won't talk about it. But extremely well-known American hero. General Schwarzkopf told an incredible story. And he told the story of when he was a one-star general. I believe, yeah, he was a one-star general and he was in charge of a small group of people and he got promoted and he got moved into the Pentagon. And he literally was suddenly in charge of three million people. And so he goes to the Pentagon with his new job and he starts his new job and shortly after his new job, uh, his boss comes to him and says, hey Norm, I'm leaving for a month. I'm gonna go do this, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna take some vacation time. And, and Schwarzkopf said, I said to him, what do I do? And the guy says, you make a decision and you stick with it. You can always change your mind and there's nothing wrong with changing your mind, but you have to be firm and make the decision. And he went on to tell a story of the group of people in the Pentagon that he was working with spent a year on a particular decision. He never told us what the decision was. They spent a year bringing all these people into, a, into Washington for an entire year studying this issue. And at the end of the day, this group came together to, to do a report to Schwarzkopf and his boss. They made a report in 45 minutes and it was an A or B decision. And without thinking particularly hard about it, his boss said A. And they left and Schwarzkopf and he were walking down the hall and he said, I gotta ask you a question. They spent a year making that decision. How in fact did you come to the conclusion so quickly that A was the right answer? And he said, I didn't. He said, these people know the, the basis of this stuff much better than we ever will. The only way if we know this is ever gonna work is to test it and put it out in the field. Why would I waste any more time to do it? I made a decision. And he said, you know what's the worst thing that happens? A year from now, we switch to B. Okay, but we made a decision, we sent a real clear message that A was the right answer. So again, consistency. Hiring the right people. If there's one thing you learn today, if nothing else, if you walk away from this and say it was a waste of time, which I would understand, I'm sure you all have better things to do this morning, okay, is hiring the right people. There is a concept that um, a number of people will talk about, if you have not read Danny Meyer's book, Setting the Table, it's an absolute necessity and an absolute mandate that you read it. It's really easy reading. Danny is a restaurateur in New York that runs the best restaurants in New York. He also owns the Shake Shack chain. Um, they have, inside of a short amount of time, Shake Shacks all around the world, including Kuwait and Dubai. Um, it was a, his idea to uh, respond to uh, Five Guys. That having been said, Danny and Rich Melman from Let Us Entertain You in Chicago talk about the 51% employees. Very simple philosophy. 51% attitude. Okay, You hire the person with the right attitude. Any of you who have done a job and do it well can train somebody to do your job. But you can't train somebody for attitude. And so when you're sitting in the position or standing in the position that anybody in the front row that's spoken to us already, or me, or anybody else, and you're in the position to hire employees, you hire for attitude. Along the same lines, you fire the moldy apples. You know, fact is that if you have a moldy apple in a bushel, very soon you're gonna have a moldy bushel, okay? And it's a fact, and all of you have worked in places that have bad employees, and you know the damage that bad employees can do. They can make life really miserable for everybody. They can, they can spread information that's not true. They do. And you need to fire them. And I know it sounds cold and crass, but the fact is that if somebody is really, I always love calling people moldy, but if you do have a moldy person, if you do have somebody who's the bad influence, you need, in fact, to get rid of them because they will be your downfall. Um, every day, we open up the, the web and or we, we get down, downloads of things that have happened because people have put information on the web that's not true, employees. Um, it happened, I read it in USA Today. Again, for those of you that haven't had the, the, the chance to see this, you will see it. Starbucks got some bad press because an employee did something online that's not factually incorrect, but it was framed in the wrong way. Uh, apparently Starbucks is changing a lot of the ingredients and in a lot of their things to be all natural. They apparently got rid of the artificial supplement that makes the strawberry frappuccino and replaced it with a natural product. 
The natural product that they replaced it with, I know this is going to sound gross, the natural product they replaced it with is a ground up beetle. Okay? The beetle is used in a ton, this particular beetle is used in a ton of different food products. But the employee went online, started something with social media, and as you can imagine, this has gained traction. Here we are, this started two or three days ago, and now it's in USA Today. Um, and they were saying there's better products they could use, and they have a PR nightmare on their hands, and this one won't be over. But again, I'm not suggesting you go fire that person, but if you actually train them and educate them, which is something we'll talk about in a second, that won't happen. So, how ironic. Train and educate. There is a big difference between training and education. About two years ago, I had the opportunity to give a presentation to um, a group of developers, ironically, for um, a company owned by another member of Eric's Club. And I was giving this presentation, as was Don Smith. And Don and I got into a running battle over two days about this. Don is train everybody, train everybody, train everybody. It's a total necessity. And I got into an argument with Don, and we joke about it to this day, that there is a necessity to train, but there's also a bigger necessity, at least in my mind, to educate people. We can't assume, when you talk about employees, that people understand why we make decisions as employers. We make the decision, Starbucks makes that decision to put a ground up beetle in their strawberry frappuccino, they probably should have figured out a way to educate people about why they did it. The fact is that if I'm hiring or if, I'm, if I've actually got a waiter and I want the, the dining room to look identical, that is training. There's no, there's no need to educate a waiter about why I want silverware one inch from the bottom of the table. That in fact is flat out training. But we do a bad job often of not educating people. We put them into jobs and in fact we tell them this is the way it has to be and we don't assume they're intelligent and frankly that's often wrong. I have found the more I educate my staff, the more transparent I've been with, with people, the better employee they become. And so when I walked in to the Union Club in 1993, in the very first month the financial statements came out, at the second meeting, uh, or the, the next staff meeting, I handed out the financial statement, and lo and behold, there were people that had been in that room for 15 and 20 years that had never seen a Union Club financial statement. They had never seen any information, not just about the Union Club, but they had never seen any information about their own departments. Okay, I am constantly amazed as a consultant. I walk into a kitchen and I say to the chef, what was your food cost last month? And maybe we're on the 20th of the month and he goes, I don't know, I haven't found out yet. And I'm like, it's 20 days after the month ended? That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard because the problem is, let's assume that his, his or her food cost is wrong, and there's, or let's assume that there, there was something wrong in that month they can't correct it. It's now gone another 20 or 30 days since, in fact, there was a problem. So the need to be transparent, the need to educate, it is a real change to me in the way we treat employees today. Talking about educating yourself, you know, um, we all are here. We all have a tie into the college for obvious reasons. Um, you heard Steve mention that I continue to teach. But I also will tell you that the other thing I do, and I guarantee you that everybody in the front row does this too, is we have a thirst for knowledge. Okay? We don't get better unless we continue to educate ourselves. And it doesn't matter how you do it, it's the why you do it. You do it to be better. You do it to, to learn more. Whether it's the two newspapers, the old-fashioned print newspapers that most of you guys don't read, okay? You know, the two that I read every morning, plus I probably get 25 to 30 daily downloads from different publications and different sources. Some are from the club managers, some are from the National Restaurant Association, some are from lodging organizations. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that I read all of them every day? Of course not. 
There's days that either I'm traveling or I'm too busy. But I will tell you that I take the opportunity to scan them and look for the occasional headline that's interesting. And so sometimes I'll be in a meeting um, with, a, with a club client and something about the restaurant business will come up and somebody will say, how'd you know that? And I'll say, well, because I involved with the National Restaurant Association or because I do some consulting for restaurants. Whatever it is, the fact is I read profusely. Um, I, I read tons of stuff. But I also don't just read the stuff for the business. I, I read for fun, okay? Um, look, there are books like Danny Meyer's book that I could read and, and, and I went back and reread it um, all the time. In an anticipation of speaking today, um, I pulled out my copy of Be My Guest, Conrad Hilton's book, okay? Um, and I was fascinated because it was the first time that I had looked at it in a long time. And Conrad, unlike some of the books that you might read today, the leadership-oriented books, Conrad Hilton's book is nothing more than a biography of what he did. It doesn't have a tremendous amount of leadership stuff in it. But it was really fascinating in how he got to certain things. So you read and you, you, you learn and you have the opportunity to go to seminars and you have to do that and you have to continue to do that. In order to be successful, you need to have the resources to be successful and equally importantly when you have employees you need to give them the resources okay it's the most amazing thing to me I went into a, a, a club the other day and they were complaining that they weren't selling any wine they have a great wine list they have a really world-class wine list and so I went in and it took me exactly two minutes to figure out why they weren't selling any wine they weren't selling any wine because first of all the physical setup for the employees to get the wine was ridiculous literally the the wine buckets were here and the ice machine was there and the bartender who controlled the wine was over there and the fact is we were taking them off the floor we literally were taking people off the floor for five or six minutes to pick up a bottle of wine. Well, the fact is that then we got mad at them why they weren't on the floor. So what did we do? This sounds really stupid. We moved the wine buckets next to the ice machine and we put in a wine cabinet and wine sales went up 50% the first month. Okay? It's just resources and that's a really silly little example. But people do that stuff all the time. You cannot expect a cook to produce an item in the kitchen if you don't give he or she the right equipment to, to produce it. It's just not going to work. You cannot say um, we're going to do a new fish dish a la plancha if you don't have a plancha. Okay? It's just the fact of life. Um, you can't get a grill pan hot enough you need a plancha. Oh, I hit it again. Okay. Um, never lowering your standards. The standards that you set for yourself are in fact the ones or your business are the ones that need to be in place. When I was at the Union Club, we had a standard and the standard was really simple on service when we did banquets. And it's just the Union Club. We had one waiter for every 10 people in banquets. And I can't tell you how many times over the course of time people would come in and we would do a proposal and they would say to us, I want to save a little money. And I'd say, fine, let's look at the menu. Let's look at, at beverages in a serve. And they say, well, you know, what can we do on service? And the, abs the answer is absolutely nothing. Okay? That's the one thing we will not bend on. And why would we not bend on it? Because when you came to the Union Club, the one thing you were always guaranteed, I'd like to think the food was good, I'd like to think that, that you always got the beverages you wanted and the style you wanted, but service was always going to be great. Okay? And that way, if somebody came in and spent $50 for a function or spent $500 for a function, they always got the same quality. Okay? You can go to a party and walk away later and say, geez, I wish there was more food. That's the host's fault that they didn't want more. If we tried to sell it to them and they didn't want more, that's fine. But we needed to make sure that our standards were met. Our standards were met in, in something as simple as food and beverage. They were met in the quality of the staff we hired. We hired the number three squash pro in the world one year to actually be our squash pro and he set the tone for squash pros after him. The squash pros that have been at the Union Club since then are world class. The chef 
that has always been at the Cherokee Town and Country Club in Atlanta, Georgia for the last probably 20 to 25 years has always been a master chef. They were the first club to hire a master chef. At the time there were probably only 45 of them in the country and they have continued. And at one point they had Tom Catherall who went on the Culinary Olympic team. They had Chris Northwood who was the chef, the pastry chef on the Culinary Olympic team. But they always hired master club, sh master chefs and frankly that's what the club members of the Cherokee Town and Country Club have come to, expe to expect and they're not going to change that. Vision, values, and goals. <coughs> what you set for your vision is who you are. Okay, What your values are or what you are. I mentioned earlier we all make mistakes. I made them. I made, I'm, I've made them a hundred times. Okay, um, I've made mistakes when I, I've kind of mixed up my own values at times. But you know what? I realized what was right and I went out and did the right thing. I set my goals. Okay, When I decided to start my own business, I set a goal for myself of some of the things I'd like to accomplish and I've made those goals. And so what do I do now? I raise the bar. You set goals for yourself, you set goals for your employees, you make sure that they know them. It's unfair to expect that people will do what they're supposed to do unless they know what their goals are. Okay? So if you decide, for example, that we want to raise revenue in, in a department, let's just say food and beverage, and, and let's say you're working in a hotel and you're the, the restaurant manager, and your goal is to raise 10%, you know what? You can't expect your employees to raise their bar unless you tell them and tell them why and tell them how we're going to do it and give them the resources to do it. Okay, what are we not going to do? We're not going to cheat our guests. That's part of our values. We're not going to steal from our guests. I am constantly amazed when I see stories of how um, I was actually on the web yesterday looking at a particular restaurant, um, not in Houston, okay, that I was thinking about going to in New York and I went onto a website that all of you probably go on at different times to look at this restaurant and what did I see in the quotes? At least five times in the last 15 reviews somebody said you have to watch your bill because they, they pad their bill. They pad bills. Things are on my bill that I didn't, and I'm, you know, to have it happen once is, is one thing. To have it happen or written up five times in the last 15 reviews says a lot about the restaurant. So there we have somebody, an owner or a chef or a dining room manager or a restaurant manager, whoever, who's got some pretty screwed up values. Yeah, he set goals. He basically said, let's get as much money as we possibly can. But you know what? At some point, they're going to be out of business. They're going to be out of business because it's, it's going to get around. People are going to see more and more of these reviews. And frankly, they're going to lose their ratings. Um, it's a restaurant that has very high Zagat standings in New York. And I guarantee you that those ratings or those kinds of comments will end up um, prevalent and well-known. They'll get picked up by the industry. Um, you know, one of those daily downloads that I get that's consumer driven will pick up on it fairly soon and before you know it that restaurant will have a major PR problem on their hand. Let me just kind of finish here by uh, putting a quote up here and this is a quote and you're probably going to get the theme of the day because you'll recognize who it is when you see what I, what I said here. Um, this is a quote from Conrad Hilton. Be big, think big, act big, dream big. Your value is determined by the mold you yourself make. It doesn't take any more energy to be the best housewife, the best cook, the most capable carpenter. And on that note, thank you very much. So we have time for a few questions and I'm more than glad to answer them. Um, anything anybody has? Don't be timid. You can tell I'm so shy and demure. I'll answer it honestly and truthfully. Dr. Bowen? Charles, could you explain what's happening tomorrow at 1? Oh, okay. Um, sure. Unrelated. Um, for those of you who know that the club class meets Fridays at 1, we've actually invited uh, six or seven club managers to join us at one o'clock tomorrow at the club class and, and certainly I gather that saying anybody can come. Um, 
those six or seven managers are some pretty unique individuals. There are some alums from outside of the local area. Um, uh, Bill Langley, who is the general manager up at the Woodlands, who is a club man CMAA national director. Jason's Conan Jason Konisgard, who is the senior vice president of education for the Club Managers Association out of Washington, will be here as well. And we're going to do a couple panel discussions talking about the club industry. Um, it will be a very much unscripted free-for-all. And I can tell you, knowing the individuals that are coming, it will not be a timid crowd. Um, if you have any curiosity about the club business, you will probably not find a better opportunity to ask a better group of people. Um, Marvin Jones, who's an alum of the college, is coming. Dennis Petrush is coming, um, and, and a bunch of other people. And what I'm particularly proud of, I have one of my classmates coming, um, who won't be on the panel, but he'll be here, who I don't think has been in this building in 25 years. And he is coming to hear some of the things these guys have to say as well. So please come uh, and join us if you have time. Other questions? Come on, guys, don't be so timid. Don't be so shy. There we go. You get the brownie points. Um, interesting question. What do I think about hiring or working with friends? It's a double-edged sword, um, as, as I'm sure that's probably where you were, you were starting at the beginning. The good thing is they're friends. The bad thing is they're friends. Um, I typically, as a general rule, don't work with friends, don't hire friends. Um, in the case of family, I also typically, in any place I've ever worked, do not allow family to work with us. If, if in fact I hire a family member, it's typically in a different department. But I'm even very much against that. When I went to the union club, I found a mother, a father, a daughter, and an aunt. Wouldn't necessarily be a big problem because they all worked in different departments, except we had a situation um, that for legal reasons I can't go into great detail about, but I will tell you that the executive chef of the club came and filed a harassment charge against the daughter who was a dining room captain. And first of all, that's pretty unusual. That's a senior male staff member <coughs> filing a sexual harassment charge against a union employee. She then in turn filed a counterclaim against him. But the first thing that happened is because there are four family members at the club, it, it literally became the world against the club. They did everything they could to make us look bad. At the end of the day, um, I won't tell you about the legal ramifications, I will just simply tell you, ironically, the chef left. Um, but that having been said, working with friends is really difficult. You can, to me, you can only work with friends if you're willing to lose them as friends. Because, you know, if you're on the same level with them, that's going to cause a strain in your friendship. If you're, if you're their boss, or they're your boss, that's the worst thing in the world that could happen to your relationship. Because maybe one of you is a better employee than the other. Um, and frankly, you run the risk. It's kind of the old joke about the loan money to people. You only loan money to people if you know you're not getting it back. Okay, uh, friends, you know, I've got a friend that's in deep trouble. I loan him money this week. I've already made a decision that it's probably never coming back. So, other questions? Dr. What are Paul. the opportunities for women in the club profession? There are probably better opportunities for women in the club business than there are for men at the moment. About 60% of the uh, people in hotel schools across the country are women. About 40% of the people we are hiring today are women, and that is growing by the day. When I first started, I mean, to give you a sense of how progressive the club business is, when I started in New York, in, back in New York in approximately 1980, a woman named Mary Brash retired two years later, and this is in 1980, and Mary was the general manager of the Princeton Club of New York for 25 years. So think about that. Mary Brash was hired as the general manager of one of the oldest clubs in New York in 1965, okay? Um, that right? Uh, 60, 1960, because she was there 25 years, because she left in 85. Okay, there are tons and tons of women in the club business. I probably in my career hired more women than I know I have, hired more women than I've hired men. Um, I can tell you that I did a search, just finished a search last week for an assistant general manager for a country club in White Plains, New York. There were four finalists, three of them, I'm sorry, there were five finalists, four of them were women. Okay, now I'll be honest with you, that's never happened before. It's always been pretty much 50-50. You know what? 
It doesn't matter what you do. Okay, it just matters to get stuff on your resume. Okay, so for the four years I was here, for example, my first semester, my first job was working the old front desk in this hotel. Okay, um, I worked here, for, and the, at the time, the guy who was the general manager was actually a professor here, and I worked for him, and I worked night audit because um, it was what was available to me. I then worked for Aramark here on campus for three years, okay? The fact is that you have to get work experience. It doesn't matter. Start as a bar back, start as a waitress, start as anything. And it doesn't matter where you start. Because, <coughs> excuse me, if you go and get those basic skills, okay, you can move up to the next best place. But don't try to go in and suddenly say, I want to be the assistant manager if you have no leadership experience and, and maybe it's a food and beverage property and you have no food and beverage experience. That's not realistic. Okay, we're, we're not going to put you in charge of 30 people or a shift if you don't have that experience. Or we shouldn't, I should say, because sometimes we do. Uh, bad, bad on us. Bad, bad. Um, but you do need to go out and just find anything to start, okay? The other thing, and I will just tell you, and I know you hear this a hundred times and it relates to that comment, do not leave stuff off your resume, okay? Um, I, I can tell you that I get resumes all the time and have gaps on them. I get resumes where people have left stuff off. You don't know what we on the other side are looking for, okay? Just because you were a waiter or a waitress in school for four years, that says something great to me. I look at your resume and I say, wow, this person was involved with a bunch of student leadership organizations. This person worked for four years, got through school in four years. I don't care what you did. I care that you worked. Okay, you had to work. It shows some responsibility. But don't assume that because you worked in a dive mom and pop restaurant, there's anything bad about that. If anything, you probably learned more at that mom and pop than somebody might in other places, okay? So don't leave stuff off your resume. There is a woman in New York, and obviously I will never tell you who she is, that has applied for four jobs. The first one was with me, and she got, she got to the finals and blew the interview, not a big deal. Subsequently has applied for three more jobs, and through a series of strange and freaky incidents, I've been involved in all three of those jobs. Not doing the search, but because I, I knew people and they called me. And in all three cases, the first time I discovered right at the end of the process that that woman had left a gap on a resume and forgot to tell me that she worked at a club and had a bad experience and she says, oh, don't worry about it. Um, I'll get a good reference from them. No, she won't, okay, because I talked to her old boss. So she left it off and we had a long conversation about putting it back on her resume. In each of the other three phone calls, I said to the people, tell me, you got a resume in front of you? And they said, yeah. I said, does she have this job on there? No. And I told them the story. And in all four case, all three additional cases, she didn't even get an interview. Okay, she didn't get an interview because she lied on her resume. Okay, it's too small a world. Okay, here's the dean mentioning Al Van Ness to me this morning. The dean didn't know that that I knew and worked with Al Van Ness. We all do this. We all talk to each other. We 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 know people. We pick up the phone. We we call. Don't you know so and so? Don't you know someone that works somewhere? Um, it will come back to haunt you. Okay. But anyways, I think we are just about out of time. Mr. Chair, is that uh, with the magic time you told me? Coming in afterwards. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Charles, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Big. Appreciate that. Um, your story of the money in the envelope story reminded me of an experience I had very early in my career while still working in school. I worked in a tableside flambe restaurant in South Jersey <laughs> that uh, was frequented by celebrities, but not the type that attracted paparazzi and uh, autograph seekers, if you know what I mean. I do. <laughs> and I do. Uh, and the <laughs> first couple of times it was pretty cool, but then I quickly learned that uh, you didn't hang around while they were being served. You were looking for the corner that accommodated the quickest dive out of trouble. Now, I never had to dive, thank goodness, but I learned quick from that the food and beverage business is full of some very colorful experiences. You demonstrated that today, and uh, thank you for a great story. Uh, thank you for your activism and your commitment to the college. Um, thank you for sharing uh, your entrepreneurial spirit, and uh, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you very much. Charles, don't go away, please. You're not done. Um, tradition has a little gift under here for you. And I want to share that with you. 
and I'm actually going to do it without the microphone because it doesn't accommodate that. So I hope you can hear me. But a um, little token of our appreciation is this plaque that says to Charles Dorn, Eric Hilton, Distinguished Chair Alumni Series, uh, March 29th, 2012. Thank you very much. You know, I, I was surprised not to hear that, uh, and I know you've had to trust a lot of people in your life to get where you are today. I'm going to ask you to trust me and sit back. <laughs> that was well done. <laughs> and enjoy another gift from us. You <laughs> scared the hell out of me. <laughs> but you trusted me, didn't I you? did. I did. I did. Thank you, Charles. Great Thank story. You. Thanks. Now, a lot. can I sit? Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, don't forget that there is another program later today at 2 o'clock in the Hall of Honor, uh, Q&A with Charles. Uh, if you see any of the other uh, distinguished lecturers here, please stop them, introduce yourself, ask questions. All our biographies are, are in uh, the program. Thanks very much for participating and good luck.